call with Senators John McCain and Lindsey Graham. Senators, thanks again. I want to turn to an audience question to start off this uh, this block. Christopher Harlig from Scottsdale, Arizona. Wait, Senator Chris. McCain, this one's for you. Good evening, Thank Senators. You uh, Senator McCain, as a constituent of your state, I want to know if you are doing everything in your power to investigate any claims of foreign interference in our electoral process or in our government itself. And if you are, what do you recommend to those of us who are very concerned about this issue? Well, first of all, uh, and the areas of responsibility that I as have as chairman of the Armed Services Committee, we're looking into certain military aspects of it. I have argued that because of the gravity if of the situation, if the Russians had succeeded in determining the outcome of our election, that is a death blow to democracy. And so I believe that we needed a select committee in order to investigate that. Now, on the other allegations, the intelligence committees are looking at it. And I'd like to give them a chance to uh, examine the facts and uh, come up with some conclusions before I leap to the need for a, a whole new special committee. When you set up a special committee, there has to be, pro oh, it's a long process, uh, and so I'd like to give this a chance. But have no doubt, what the Russians tried to do it, to our election could have destroyed democracy. And that's why we've got to pay a hell of a lot more attention to, uh, uh, to the Russians and the things that they're doing in Europe. And the, right now, they're trying to affect the outcome of the French election. Mm -hmm. And they're using cyber, which, by the way, brings up cyber. We are way behind in cyber. Senator, that, that is obviously one area that the intelligence agencies say that they're confident that Russia tried to meddle in, in U.S. Yeah, elections. But we need but to there's... know how. We need to know uh, the methods they used. We need to know right. how we can counter. There's a whole lot we need to learn about what they did. No question. But second, uh, the second sort of area of investigation is whether or not there was any discussion collusion and so forth uh, between the Trump campaign and the Russians. I want to tell you, uh, Senator Graham, that the Washington Post has new reporting out just a few moments ago that Jeff Sessions, former senator, now the attorney general, also a campaign advisor to Donald Trump, spoke twice last year with Russia's ambassador to the U.S. Uh, encounters that he did not disclose during his confirmation hearing. If true, is a special prosecutor needed now? Well, number one, uh, don't worry about John and Lindsey Graham and others looking into Russia because Russia is not our friend. Trump, President Trump, I want to help as much as I can because he's got a mess on his hands. He seems to get Iran right. He seems to get ISIL right. This nut job in North Korea, he understands the threat. When it comes to Russia, he has a blind spot. The bottom line is that Putin is disrupting democracy everywhere. Democracy is an enemy to every strong man in the world, including Putin. If there were contacts between the Trump campaign and Russian officials, they may be legitimate, they may be okay. I want to know what happened between the Trump campaign, the Clinton campaign, and the Russians. Because today is the Russians, tomorrow it could be the Iranians. And to my Republican friends, we should have no joy in our heart that the Russian efforts hurt Hillary Clinton, even though they didn't change the outcome, I promise you, we could be next when it comes to the Iranians and to the Chinese. So I'm Senator on the Judiciary Committee with Senator Whitehouse. I promise you, we're going to look at everything Russia. If there were campaign contacts between the Russians and the Trump campaign, I want to know about them. Senator, you say you're on the Judiciary Committee. Your committee and, of course, the full Senate supported Jeff Sessions. Yeah. He's now the top law, law enforcement official in this country. If he didn't disclose what he apparently did during the campaign, what do you make of that? Well, you know, I don't know. It may be an innocent contact. I don't know if he has to disclose everybody he's ever talked to, a special prosecutor. I think, here, I think we have to know more about it yeah. before we can make a judgment. Special here. prosecutor, meaning there okay, should be one? Okay, here's the deal. I don't know if there's anything between the Trump campaign and the Russians. I'm not going to base my decision based on newspaper articles. The FBI, if they're looking into this and they make a, Comey shouldn't decide whether or not to prosecute. I've never understood why the FBI director in the Clinton case made a decision not to prosecute. That should be a prosecutor's decision. If there is something there and it goes up the chain of investigation, it is 
clear to me that Jeff Sessions, who is my dear friend, cannot make this decision about Trump. So they may be not, there may be nothing there, but if there's something there that the FBI believes is criminal in nature, then for sure you need a special prosecutor. If that day ever comes, I'll be the first one to say it needs to be somebody other than Jeff. I just want to ask a follow-up on a related issue. The New York Times is also reporting tonight that in the final days of the Obama administration, some White House officials, Obama White House officials, scrambled to spread information across the government about Russian efforts to undermine the 2016 election, including information about possible contacts between Russians and associates of Donald Trump. Was that appropriate? From what you're telling me, and it's really kind of hard to make judgments I understand. when I understand. That, uh, yeah. then that that also deserves further scrutiny. But again, it's hard for me to reach conclusions when you're just quoting from the latest news. Yeah, yeah. communist That's, sources, yeah. by the way, too. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's understandable. Okay, On that yeah. note, let's go to uh, another audience member. I want to bring in Anya Luberskaya. She's a student here at GW and a staff sergeant in the United States Air Force with a question for Senator Graham. Anya. Yeah. Air power. For Senator McCain as well. Sure. Good evening. Uh, as someone from the former Soviet Union whose family lived through the uncertainty of the Cold War and the nuclear arms race, I would like to ask you, Senator, to make the best case for us tonight for why the United States should consider Russia a foe, especially in matters c concerning the war on terror and arms control. Thank you. Did, was this, you you uh, can start, Senator. Vladimir Putin wants to restore the old Russian empire. He's invaded Georgia. He's invaded Ukraine. He is now attempting to affect the outcome of elections. He's putting enormous pressure on the Baltics. Uh, one of the greatest men I've ever known, Boris Nemtsov, was murdered in the shadow of the Kremlin. Uh, he was in my office. I said, Boris, do not go back to Russia. They're going to try to kill you. He said, I have to go back. A month later, they shot him and killed him in the shadow of the Kremlin. Let's know what Vladimir Putin is. He's a thug. He's a KGB agent, and he's a killer. And treat him as such. And what does he understand? Strength. That's why we have to rebuild our military. And that's why, frankly, we are not doing enough to rebuild that military and its capabilities. So all I can say is peace through strength. And I think that that's one thing that Vladimir Putin would understand. Here's the case to the American people. If you let Putin get away with this, then we're opening ourselves up for endless attacks by foreign entities. Let us make our own decisions about who we'd like to be president. Putin hates democracy. Two critics have died from plutonium poisoning. I don't know how many of your friends have died from weapons grade plutonium in their drink, but these people in Russia play really hard. The Duma is a joke. The independent judiciary has been lost. He wants to break the back of the European and NATO. He hates coalitions of democracy. He dismembered the Ukraine. He's affecting the Baltics day in and day out. The democracy's in his shadow under threat. I just got back from France and Germany. He went to Syria. I went to France and Germany, which shows I'm a lot smarter than he is. <laughs> the French and the Germans are scared to death about the Russians playing into their elections. The Russians are openly helping right-wing parties in uh, these countries who want to withdraw from NATO and the European Union. Vladimir Putin is not a friend to democracy. He is a crook. I don't know what you make as president of Russia, but he's estimated to be worth between 40 and 60 billion dollars. Either he's the best money manager in the world or he's a crook. I think he's a crook, and I wish our president, who I want to help, would stand up to Putin and say that an attack on one party in America is an attack on all of us. Ronald Reagan dealt. <laughs> Ronald Reagan dealt with Brezhnev and other uh, then Soviet Union leaders, but he dealt from a position of strength. And for the last 10, eight years, we have let our defenses decline. Uh, we have cut spending on defense. We are not ready. We have one-third of the aircraft. Half the F-18s in the Navy can't fly right now. Marine Corps pilots are flying few hours a month than their Russian and Chinese counterparts. Air Force maintainers are stealing parts from muse museums in Tucson, Arizona. 
two of the 60 Army Brigade combat teams are at the, are at the highest level of readiness. That's the result of eight years of Obama, and I'm glad the president is committed to rebuilding our military. What he said last night was not true. That is only a 3 percent increase. We need a much larger increase in defense spending. Senators, I want to bring in another member of our audience, uh, George Salo from Ohio. He owns a Ukrainian restaurant that his father started after emigrating here from Ukraine. George. Senators, good evening. President Trump said recently that he expects the Russian government to de-escalate violence in Ukraine and return Crimea. The Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances signed under the Clinton administration in 1994 was to protect Ukraine, <clears throat> including Crimea. And, if my guaranteed, father, and guaranteed Crimea to be part of Ukraine. Correct. If my father were still alive, he would wonder, will our, uh, will our government fail to keep its promises about our security to its citizens the same way as fail to keep the, its promises with Ukraine? And what is the United States plan to help Ukraine now? A couple of months ago, I went with President Poroshenko to Mariupol, and we met with the frontline troops. He gave out medals to the, some of these brave Ukrainian Marines and soldiers that are fighting, and he gave a medal to a mother whose son had just been killed by a Russian sniper. I'll tell you, that's pretty moving, and we're not doing enough about it. And we need to help the Ukrainians. And the first thing we could do that, that President Trump could do is give the Ukrainians defensive weapons mm. so they can defend themselves against superior Russian equipment. They're slaughtering Ukrainians with superior equipment. And the Obama administration wouldn't give them lethal weapons to defend themselves. And your question is a good one. I hope people are following this. After the Soviet Union fell apart, there was all hell was breaking out. So we went to the Ukraine where there were, I think, 1,200 nuclear weapons stationed in the Ukraine. And basically we said, if you'll turn those nuclear weapons back over to Russia, at the time, sort of an ally, then we all, including the Russians and the United States, will guarantee your territorial integrity. What did Putin do? He stepped all over that. So why would anybody trust us in the future? And the last time somebody in Europe reached out and grabbed territory by force not belonging to them, it led to World War II. So not only should we never forgive the sanctions, relieve sanctions that exist on the Crimea, we should impose new sanctions. Don't you want Russia to pay a price for interfering in our election? I want the Russians to be sanctioned more for interfering in our election. And the last thing Trump should ever envision is relieving sanctions to reward them for taking Crimea by force because Putin will not stop until somebody makes him stop. Senators, we have another, we have another question over here. Kelly Bennett, her husband is in the Army and works closely with the intelligence agencies. Kelly? Good evening, Senators. Thank you for your service. Um, President Trump's open disdain for the intelligence community, possible ties to Russia, and his off-the-cuff manner in dealing with foreign policy issues and leaders is troubling. My husband serves very proudly, but we worry that he and others may be needlessly sent into dangerous situations due to a combination of those factors. What will you do to help avoid that type of situation? First of all, I'd like to thank your husband for his service to our country. I would like to point out that the national security team that President Trump has assembled, <clears throat> I couldn't have picked a better group of people. General Mattis is revered by, by uh, all who served uh, under him. Uh, General uh, McMaster, uh, yeah, McMaster is, is one of those who really was key in the, in the Iraqi conflict in the early days. Um, uh, General Kelly is also great. And so we, he's assembled an outstanding national security team. And I'm hoping, I'm not positive, but I'm hoping that he will rely on them for the advice and counsel because they have the respect of all of us who know anything about the military. So I'm not sure, and I can't look you in the eye and say that that's going to happen, but I am optimistic that President Trump will listen to these really brave and seasoned individuals. And, and Senator Graham, as you respond, I think what Kelly was, was getting at was yeah. the idea that she's concerned about some of the statements that President Trump has made that could potentially put her husband in harm's way. Well, so number one, the intelligence community, those in uniform and those who serve in the shadow, are really brave. Can you imagine what it's like to be a CIA person on the ground <laughs> somewhere over there? So the bottom line is 
they don't get much credit because we can't talk about what they do. So I would beg the president to recognize them as the heroes they are. This team around President Trump is outstanding. The guy I saw last night can govern this country. The guy I saw last night we can all do business with. But there's one thing that we haven't talked much about. This seems to be military night. I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan with John McCain in 40 times. What have I learned? You're never going to win this war through military force alone. The budget the president's proposing cuts the State Department by over 30 percent. That is soft power. And I will tell you, Mr. President, Obama made a mistake by leaving Iraq too soon. We begged him to leave troops. Uh, when, you when you draw a red line, you better enforce it. When you let Assad get away with it, all hell is broken loose. So to President Trump, if you destroy soft power, those diplomatic tools that lead to holding and building, we'll never win this war. If you take off the table building a small schoolhouse for a poor young girl in Afghanistan, Iraq, or Syria to give her an education, we'll never win this war because an education to a poor young girl is far more damaging to radical Islam than any bomb. That's got to be on the table. After Qaddafi was... <laughs> After Gaddafi was killed, we went to Libya <laughs> yes. again. And we came back and said, look, the hard part begins. You got to clear the weapons. You got to enforce the borders. You have to start building democracy. We walked away. Look at Libya today. That's the example of not using the soft power after the hard power has already been used. Can I just follow on that? In 2006, we went to President Bush. This is not working. I made mistakes. I talking about Iraq. Yeah, Iraq. I didn't appreciate Iraq would be as hard as it was. Blame me. But after about the fourth visit, the first time John and I went, we were in uh, uh, SUV. We went downtown and bought rugs and walked around. The second time, we were in a convoy. The third time, we were in a tank. This is not getting better. <laughs> so it wasn't a few dead enders. And Senator McCain, to his credit, during the presidential campaign for our party was a lone voice for saying we need more troops in a war that everybody was tired of because he understood you couldn't lose it and if we don't have more troops we're going to lose it. President Bush to his credit adopted the surge and the surge did work. To and President Trump, if you take soft power off the table, if you dismantle the State Department, we don't have any tools other than military force, you'll be making the same mistake the other two presidents we made. Also, we also told the president President Bush, he had to fire his Secretary of Defense. Yeah. On that yeah. note, we're going to have to take a quick <laughs> break. Stand by, everybody. We'll be right back with more from CNN's town hall with Senators John McCain and Lindsey Graham. Welcome back to the CNN town hall with Senators John McCain and Lindsey Graham. Gentlemen, we have uh, another audience question. This one comes from Sunny Adams of South Carolina. For you, Senator Graham. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, this is for Senator Graham. Uh, as a Republican from my beloved state of South Carolina, I feel, as many, that you have done much to undermine the president, his administration, mm -hmm. as well as his calls to safety. And I would like to know when and how you would answer to the nearly 62 million constituents who voted Republican and want his protection and his changes? That's really a good question. You know what I hear a lot from Republicans? Help the president more. <clears throat> I hear from Democrats and independents, save the country. Here's what you can expect from me, what you've gotten for the last 20 years. I want to help President Trump, but when I don't agree with him, I'm okay with saying I don't. I think his plan for immigration is becoming more realistic. I want to help him win a war we can't afford to lose. My biggest fear is not losing my job. My biggest fear is not standing up and speaking out when I know it's right. <clears throat> Lindsey Graham and I have a record on national security policy. And I'll go all the way back to Ronald Reagan. I said, don't put Marines in, in Beirut. There was a bombing in the Beirut barracks and 134 Marines died. 
I t when, when we saw this, the, <clears throat> the war in Iraq going badly, we said, you've got to fire the generals, you've got to <clears throat> fire the Secretary of Defense if you want to win this war in Iraq, and we ha started the surge, and it succeeded. And then when Obama pulled the plug, when he pulled the plug, we said, don't do that, otherwise Iraq is going to go back to hell in a handbasket. And the, I could go on and, and example after example where with our experience and our knowledge and our background, we think we are qualified to make judgments. And for us to just go along to get along with any president, whether it be Republican or Democrat, is an abrogation of our responsibilities to the men and women in uniform and the people we represent. And, and can I just talk about the times? <laughs> The times in which we live. To my Republican friends, we have a unique opportunity once in a lifetime. We've got the White House, we've got both houses of Congress, and here's the best way to succeed, is put the country ahead of the party. When I voted for Sotomayor and Kagan, I got the crap beat out of me at home. Now that I'm going to support Gorsuch, I'm a hero. Here's the deal. I thought Sotomayor and Kagan were qualified even though I wouldn't have picked them. Now, all of a sudden, the people who are beating me up are going to say, why don't you do what Lindsey did as a Democrat? The best way to serve the Republican Party, I think, is putting the country ahead of everything else, and it all works out. My favorite story was when Social Security was about to go bankrupt, and two old Irishmen got together in the White House, and they came out in the Rose Garden together, Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, and they said, we're going to save Social Security, and it's going to be tough and hard. That's because they had a relationship, those two old Irishmen. They used to get together and have drinks and tell old Irish jokes. Because, because <laughs> Ronald Reagan established a relationship with Republicans and Democrats alike. Don't you think the American people want us to work together? Do you think President Trump has that capacity? I think he has that capacity, I do. I think he's a deal maker's deal maker, and uh, I'm going to meet him soon. I, you know, <clears throat> we're getting closer. I haven't given him my cell number phone. yet. <laughs> <laughs> I've given him the uh, area code, but not the whole number. <laughs> so The new one. So, we already yeah. know he ruined so the old here's one. Here's the deal. He beat me and 16 other people. He beat the former first lady and the secretary of state. What he did was an amazing thing. We should all honor his victory. I do. And I want to help him as much as I possibly can, but I'm not going to change my view of the world. I'm not going to tell people in South Carolina, all of a sudden you can port 11 million people when I never believe you could to begin with. There's a difference between his mother and the man that killed his son. I've seen that for decades. And if the president sees that, then he'll have the best friend in Lindsey Graham and John McCain. Let me tell you about Senator McCain. Name one person who <laughs> suffered more for his country than John McCain. Yeah. If you want to rebuild the military, you're going to need his help. I want to bring in another questioner. He lies. <laughs> Go ahead. Dr. Dan Dirksen from Arizona ah. with a question about health care for Senator McCain. Hey, doctor. Senator McCain, uh, Arizona's done really well the last couple of years. We're in the top five for job growth. We've almost halved our uninsured, and we're hoping for a final four appearance with the Wildcats. Uh, go Cats. Um, as a family doc, though, I'm, I'm very concerned that some of the talk and some of the plans around capping and cutting Medicaid will just shift the risk from the federal government to states, to rural hospitals, and to the uh, physicians and the 70 million Americans who currently depend on Medicaid for coverage. Senators, how will you work to make sure that we don't return to the days of 48 million uninsured in our country and that we don't punish cost-efficient, effective states like Arizona who have responsibly run their Medicaid program uh, through caps and cuts in Medicaid? Well, thank you, doctor, and thank you for all you do. Um, and in case our other audience members don't know here, we were probably the hardest hit of any state in America. We had premiums that went up by 150%. Every one of our counties had only got down to one provider. For a while, we had one county that had no providers. So nobody was hit harder than, than, than our state was. And when you look at deductibles in the thousands and co-pays in the thousands, it becomes, <clears throat> and, and it's still unraveling. It's our job now to do what we promised the American people in the last election, and that is to repeal and replace 
And the first priority is not to leave anyone without the opportunity to have health care. That has to be, I think, the underpinning of, uh, of, of any uh, reforms that we may make. And I would like to give states that have experimented in a different way an opportunity to follow those exper experiments. What, what works in Arizona may not work in Massachusetts. And by the way, Massachusetts has got a pretty good program, as you know. That's the first nice thing I've said about Massachusetts in years. But uh, the, the People's Republic of Massachusetts, I mean, I apologize. It was just a joke. I apologize. The, the, uh, so so let's, let's, let some, uh, let's give the states the funds and let's let them do some experimentation as to what is best for those states. But there has to be an underlying principle, and that is we're not going to throw anybody off of health care to not be able to have the opportunity to get it. As long as that a fundamental principle is there, we'll be fine. But doing that, Senator Graham, as, as you come in here, has proven to be pretty hard. Republicans, as you said, control everything, and even deciding amongst yourselves, despite the fact that you've promised for repealing right. Obamacare for the past, you know, three, four election cycles, you're not, doesn't seem like you're even close to getting there. Well, we'll get there, I hope. Uh, uh, if we don't, we'll pay a heavy price. We're the dog that caught the car. <laughs> So the bottom line is hope Democrats will help us. I remember voting for against Obamacare on Christmas Eve, the year it passed, jammed down our throats. The best thing we can do is try to get Democrats to help us. Uh, Obamacare, uh, when we passed it, Congress was excluded, right? I said, I'm going to be noble, and I'm going to live like the average person in South Carolina. So I went into the state program. I got whacked. And I'm like 58 years old, short white guy, no kids. My premiums tripled. My deductible went up to $6,250. This is not health care reform, sir. This is just taking money from one group of people and giving health care free to another group of people. Health care reform is outcomes. If you really want to change Medicaid, make sure that a Medicaid patient doesn't have to run to the emergency room when they get sick. They actually have a doctor to a Medicaid person out there. If you smoke, you ought to pay a little bit more. What I want to do is tie our outcomes to our own behavior, reward outcomes. Medicaid and Medicare by 2042 will consume all the money you send in taxes. So we're expanding a program that is unsustainable. When you add up the unfunded liability of Medicare and Social Security, promises made that we don't have the money for, you need $72 trillion in the next 40 years. If you want us to get out of debt, we need to deal with entitlements. To President Trump, I hope you're watching. Put something like Simpson Bowles on the table. You can't take entitlements off the table and run this country. 70% of the money that we spend in Washington is interest on the debt, Medicare, and Social Security. Here's how you fix it. Younger people, you're going to have to work a little bit longer because we all live longer. Senator. People in my age you. group, you're going to have to pay a little more and take a little less. Hold that thought. We have a lot Hold more. That Hold that thought. We have a lot more to discuss with Senators John McCain and Lindsey Graham. CNN's Town Hall will be right back. Washington University, Senators John McCain and Lindsey Graham are our guests. Senators, Clap thank you again die, for right? doing this. Yeah. Uh, you earlier mentioned North Korea. And Senator McCain, I want to turn to uh, the growing threat from North Korea. North Koreans say that they're closer than ever before to being able to launch a nuclear missile at the United States. And just last month, they successfully tested a long-range ballistic missile. So I want to now bring in Mike Lee. He is a graduate of Johns Hopkins University, and his family came to the U.S. from South Korea when he was a child. Good evening, Senators. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, for the two of you, is there a red line past which you'd be willing to consider military intervention in North Korea? That's a very tough question, obviously, and that's why it's such a tough job to be President of the United States and Commander-in-Chief. I would argue that if we have conclusive evidence that the North Koreans are about to or have achieved the ability to launch an intercontinental ballistic missile that would hit the United, with a nuclear weapon on it, that would hit the United States of America, given the ruler of North Korea and that regime, you would have to seriously consider a preventive uh, strike. But before that, 
I believe that we should have that, these air de missile defense systems in South Korea, and I think we should move through that situation expeditiously. Look, we could spend a half an hour on it, but right now there's a lot of per political turmoil in South Korea, as you also know, and that also contributes to the, to the challenge. But uh, this, my friends, is of immediate danger and we're going to have to use our best capabilities and senses in order to prevent what could be a catastrophic event because they do not think like us. Finally, China is the only country in the world that has a significant influence on North Korea. We should expect the Chinese to break the uh, activities of the Rotund ruler in Pyongyang. Senator Graham? I would uh, tell the Chinese to tell the North Koreans, if you go toward developing a missile that can hit America, you're going to regret it. And we're going to stop you. And let me tell you why. Do you know anything much about North Korea? This guy's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> he just killed his half-brother, shot his uncle with an anti-aircraft gun. He's got plenty of family issues. <laughs> His grandfather claims to have beaten the Japanese single-handedly, born inside of a volcano. His father claimed to have shot 38 under in his first round of golf with 11 holes in one. That's where they lost me as a regime. <laughs> so here's what I think. I think we would be nuts to allow a crazy man the ability to develop a missile to deliver a bomb he already has to our homeland. I don't want conflict any more than you do. But the best way to avoid conflict is to intervene before it's too late. If you are so afraid of conflict, you're going to have it. So the Ayatollah is a religious Nazi. What should we do about the Iranian missile program? I got a, here's a bet. Yeah, here's a promise. Anybody that's got a missile that writes on the side of it, death to Israel, I don't want them to have it. We live in crazy times. President Trump is got North Korea right. What I would do if I were him, I would tell the Chinese, if you don't tell this guy to stop his missile program, that's a provocative act against our country, and he will regret it and mean it when you say it. And there Senator, will be repercussions with China because absolutely. of their failure to act to break yeah. uh, North Korea. Senators, I have another question from Noah. He is a student at GW. He asked us not to use his last name because he is a family member in the military. He has a question about ISIS. Thank you. Um, Senator Graham, our attempts to defeat ISIS obviously um, have not succeeded thus far. Um, and some have suggested um, that uh, we'll, we will never defeat ISIS unless we commit troops uh, to the war torn regions. Um, as a military kid, this idea it, it brings back uh, <laughs> memories and um, that were less than pleasant. And uh, just fears of, uh, for the safety of um, members who are in the military. So uh, my question is, are boots on the ground necessary to defeat ISIS? And um, if so, how do we complete our objectives while keeping our troops safe? Great question. Absolutely, they're necessary. We have 5,200 in Iraq today. John McCain and Lindsey Graham said three years ago on CNN, apparently nobody was listening, uh, that you need 10,000 U.S. forces to help the Iraqis to destroy ISIL, not 100,000. You need about the same amount, maybe less now, to take Raqqa back from ISIL inside of Syria. <clears throat> Has anyone ever told you what winning looks like in the war on terror? We knew what winning looked like in World War II. We took Berlin, we took Tokyo. So here's what I want to tell you. If you're in the military, I cannot promise you that you will not be redeployed. We need more troops in Afghanistan, not less, because if we lose there, we're all going to pay a heavy price because that's where the war started. About the enemy, you may be tired of fighting them. They're not tired of fighting you. In September the 10th, 2001, we didn't have one soldier in Afghanistan. We didn't have an embassy, not one dime of aid, and we got attacked anyway. Why? Because radical Islam is con compelled by God in their own warped way to kill everybody in this room. So if I could think of a way not to send soldiers over there, I would. But I choose to fight the war in their backyard, not ours. I choose to have partners. So that's why it's so important when we speak of the war that it's not a war against Islam. It's a war against nut jobs.
So the bottom line is, sir, your family members may have to go back because I can tell you the only reason 3,000 of us died on 9-11 and not 3 million, they couldn't get the weapons to kill 3 million of them. And the best way to be, be safe here is to have an insurance policy over there. Senator McCann, I just want to ask you briefly about CNN reporting uh, today, learning that the Pentagon is considering changes in how counterterrorism missions are approved, that military commanders could green light the missions without President Trump's approval. You're the chairman of the Armed Services yeah, Committee. I, I, Briefly, I, I, are you okay with this? I'm, I'm not only okay with it, I think that if we trust uh, these individuals with command, then we should trust their judgment, particularly in quickly evolving situations. I had a lot of criticisms of the Obama conduct for the last eight years, particularly the micromanagement of military and, and its operations. And you have to, if you give these people positions of responsibility, then you hold them responsibility, responsible. But I really believe, Dana, that we have to have more latitude in the field if we're going to succeed. And honestly, when Afghanistan, after all these years, is a, quote, stalemate, according to our <clears throat> military commander there, and when we still don't have a real good strategy in Raqqa, we, we got to give our military leadership, the latitude to act what's in their best judgment. Senator, thank you. I want to bring in retired Colonel Gregory Gatson <clears throat> over here. He served in the Army for 25 years, and his service included every major conflict, including Kuwait, Bosnia, Afghanistan, and Iraq. And it was in Iraq where he lost both of his legs above the knee and normal use of his right arm during an IED attack. Colonel. Good evening, and thank you, Senators. Uh, for the opportunity to ask you these questions. I want to thank you also for your service. Uh, given the past 15 plus years of war, how do we ensure our military has the resources to institutionalize the lessons that we've learned, particularly with uh, wounded service members and their families? Well, sir, thank you for your service. You are what America is all about, and I cannot tell you the admiration and appreciation that your fellow citizens have for you. You have made us and kept us safe, and we thank you. <laughs> it was micromanagement from the National Security Council staff, most of whom had never heard a shot fired in anger. And that was one of the reasons why we have a stalemate today in Afghanistan. We have to give the military what they need also. The military has been <clears throat> cut by some 21 percent in the last six years. My friends, there's planes that aren't flying, there's ships that aren't sailing, and there's guns that aren't shooting because we have shorted the military. And we've got to give them what they need. And second of all, I think you would share my view of this leadership we have now in the military and our national security apparatus are those that were tested as you have been and as you were. And they really have the experience and the knowledge and the background that we can have great confidence in their leadership. Thank you again. To the veterans, every veteran out there who's seeking health care should have two choices. The VA system, and if they don't like it, go to the local doctor and hospital and the rest of us will pay for it. Competition is the best thing that could happen to you. If a veteran is not well served by the VA, and there are a lot of great people in the VA, you should have a card to go anywhere you want to go and get the services available in your local community. And the rest of us who have been sitting on the sidelines, we're going to pay for it and we shouldn't complain about it because they deserve it. Now, about the military. We're headed to the smallest army since 1940. Does that make a lot of sense to you? We're going to have 278 ships in the Navy, the smallest since 1915. How do you pivot to Asia with a Navy that small? The bottom line is I applaud President Trump for understanding the needs to rebuild the military. Here's what I would suggest. $603 billion is not going to cut it. John McCain has a plan for $640 billion. You need to talk to John. But I want to end with this thought. As hawkish as I am, and I'm not hawkish, I'm just realistic. We're dealing with crazy people and we better get it right. You're never going to win the war through military force. If you take Mosul tomorrow and Raqqa tomorrow from ISIL, if you don't have a plan for the day after, it's going to fall apart again. If you don't have a governance plan, a way to deliver services to people, the terrorists are offering a glorious death 
You know what? We got to offer a hopeful life. And this is the hardest part about being a politician in war. People get tired. The bottom line is we got to stick with it on the military side, but the foreign assistance, the State Department, the soft power is the key to winning the war. President Trump, do not destroy soft power because we cannot win through military force alone. Senators, uh, you began to do this, but we also want to formally recognize Colonel Gatson. Uh, and also, there's another member of our audience here, a Medal of Honor recipient, Kyle Carpenter. Hey. Kyle Carpenter is right here. Amen. We thank them for their service. Kyle was awarded the Medal of Honor for rushing towards a hand grenade launched at him and his fellow Marines in 2010. He spent two and a half years in the hospital for rehabilitation, and President Obama honored him with the medal in 2014. Well, I would like to say thank you, and you are a role model and our inspiration. I would also point out that I'm one of the few aviators you'll know that whose number <laughs> of landings don't match the number of takeoffs. So I'm uh, very happy to see <laughs> you. Uh, uh, Can I just say one thing? Sure. Uh, I was a military lawyer, proud of my service. The only people who wanted to kill me were my clients. I'm just sort of honored to be in a room with three people like this. Thanks. <laughs> Before we go, I have to ask you, Harry Truman famously said, if you want a friend in Washington, get a dog. <laughs> but you two found each other. <laughs> His dog ran away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so many people leading up to this town hall asked me, how did they become so close? And more importantly, what is it about this friendship between the two of you? Well. I think it's common interest, common ideals, common goals for our country. Uh, we mentioned my war experience. This guy, for 23 years, spent every time on active duty in Afghanistan or Iraq. And is that how you, that, you got uh, to know no, each other? We really got to know each other when he, well, there was the impeachment. And Lindsey was one of the stars of the impeachment. If there is such said, a thing. <laughs> he, he was presenting the case for the House of Representatives that the Senate should uh, do the, uh, should decide whether they're guilty or not guilty. And he was uh, reciting a passage where uh, there were numerous phone calls made from the White House at 2 a.m to try to get a hold of Monica Lewinsky because it, the word was out that maybe she was going to go public the next day. And Congressman Graham, with the most solemn occasion, said, you know where I come from, any man calling a woman at 2 a.m. is up to no good. I knew right then that Lindsey Graham was a guy I wanted to spend time with. <laughs> <laughs> because because he's, he's entertaining, he's dedicated, and uh, by the way, his, his beginnings were rather humble, as, as many of you may uh, not know, including the fact that he raised his sister after his parents uh, died. It's quite a, it's quite a great American uh, success story. So it's common interests, common values, and... Uh, a sense of humor. A sense of humor. <laughs> And uh, I just wish our beloved friend Joe Lieberman were here. They would called us the, Petraeus called us the, the three amigos, another wonderful person that we've enjoyed the pleasure of his company for 20 some years. Well, what do we, Senator Graham, what do we not know about John McCain? <laughs> don't, don't. <laughs> that you can say on TV? Yeah, or cable, <laughs> say anything. You know, the, I think what you see is what you get. Uh, there's not the private side of John McCain that is much different. He's cantankerous and, <laughs> and be a complete jerk to, to his closest friends and hug you dearly next. Here's what started all this. John asked me to support him for president. You know why I did? Because he asked. No one ever asked me before. Uh, so over that, between then and now, I've been all over the world with him and the worst possible. Let me tell you, if he reads in the paper, 5,000 people slaughtered, he said, we got to go there. I said, why do we have to go there? But John, uh, to me, uh, has one quality that is really special. He will fight for his friends. In 2014, I had six primary opponents from mildly disturbed to completely crazy. John came down and stood by me because I dared work with people on the other side to solve an immigration problem. I'm a good conservative, I think, but I don't mind working with the other side. John was going to be up for election, 
and I wasn't the most popular person on talk radio. He stood with me and followed me around everywhere I went. When I ran for president, most of you missed it. <laughs> John was with me. The bottom line is, folks, that the people that he served with in jail will tell you the same thing in prison that I will tell you. He is loyal to his friends. He loves his country. And if he has to stand up to his party for his country, so be it. He would die for this country. I love him to death. That's a very Feel nice like note to over end now. on. <laughs> Could I just? Very nice. Do you want to yeah. say one more thing? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that uh, we've talked about some very tough issues tonight. Uh, and I still believe in America. I still believe we're the greatest nation on earth. I still believe that uh, we have the best military. And by far, we're still a shining city on a hill, as Ronald Reagan called us. And if there's one thing I would urge all of our friends on both sides of the aisle to look at Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill, look at a time when Republicans and Democrats sat down together for the good of the nation. It's not an accident that we have low approval ratings. The American people want us to get things done for them, and we need to do it in a bipartisan fashion. And that's what we are dedicated to trying to do. That is a very nice place to end. Senators, thank you so much. We want to thank Senators McCain and Graham uh, for being here, our partners at my alma mater, the George Washington University, and our audience, those asking questions and sharing their stories, and also those watching around the world. Don Lemon picked up right now.